All right, so today I want to talk about WebGL. Um, first of all, why me? Uh, we are a web agency. I'm uh, developing a lot in, in the front end, and we had some recent projects with WebGL, so I have real experience uh, with a quite complex problem I'll talk a bit later. Um, so first of all, why WebGL? We have Canvas, we have SVG. Um, WebGL gives you, on one hand, it gives you the GPU performance, so you can render quite fast, and you can render quite complex scenes, where in Canvas you have to write a lot of code yourself. WebGL gives you some kind of abstractions, uh, similar to OpenGL. So, first I want to show you some demos, which are probably famous demos. This one is done with WebGL. Basically, it's a 3D scene with a tree and some animations, um, which is a quite simple demo. And you can also do some kind of games. So this one is a, a famous game. Uh, it's Google Maps on a cube. And the idea is your position works like a, a ball. And when you move the, uh, your pointer, it goes up and down. Uh, like one of these games where you have to move around the ball, um, so that's it's not as intuitive as you as a real one, but it's quite fun. And they mapped uh, a Google Map on this thing. You can see that was my first try. I was quite bad till I understood how it works. <laughs> it, it gets better, um, but these are things you can do with WebGL, and they are quite fun. A lot of games. Yeah, somewhere in the end, I mix it and I finish some other ones. All right. Um, so let's start with the basics. When you start out with WebGL or with any 3D graphics, first you have a scene. It means you have a 3D room um, and nothing in it. So, and then you just put everything else in and you're finished. <laughs> okay, uh, let's start with else. So first you have the scene. And uh, on that scene, you have to render some kind of thing. So it, uh, it's called a mesh. Basically, this one here would be a mesh, a cube, which is a mesh. A mesh consists of um, a few important things. The first, of course, it has a position and it has a rotation. Uh, on top of that, it has some kind of geometry, which means you have some pyramids, like triangles, and you put a lot of triangles together to make a form. And on top of that, you give some kind of material. So if you have something which is wood, it has a different material uh, than if you have a metal or something. We'll go into that later. And then you have a camera. The camera is basically the thing which decides what is rendered on the screen. This is the camera, and you can move the camera around. You can zoom in and out, visually speaking. And this is the basics of every 3D rendering. And then uh, you add some lights, which affect the materials, like the renderings of the materials. And you have a renderer, which is the thing which translates the 3D model to some 2D image. OK, so WebGL has all of that. Awesome. Um, there are a few things to think about. The first one is browser support. Browsers are catching up slowly, but actually it's quite good already. So you can see most modern browsers support WebGL. There, there's a few things which you can see here, like technically the, the new browsers support WebGL, um, but it also has some hardware limitations. So if you have, for example, these 150 euros tablets, they often don't have WebGL, or they're missing some essential libraries for WebGL, so it's not really usable. <laughs> but it's quite solid, so you can do a lot of things with these browser supports. The next one is abstractions. Um, if you want to code directly in WebGL and you want to do something really simple like this, let's make a square and a triangle, nothing else. Uh, it's a huge amount of code. I printed it very small. That's not all code. You need a bit more. So it's quite a lot of code for these two things. Um, so basically, you want to use an abstraction library. There are many out there. Uh, we decided to use 3GS. It's one of the most used ones and provides a wide array of use cases. Um, so 
in 3GS, first when you start out, you define a scene, as we had before. You define a camera and you define a renderer. Um, the next thing we have to define how the renderer renders to to the actual the canvas where like the 2D image is shown, and we then add it to the document. That's quite basically you'll always copy paste that part, and then we have to have some kind of thing to render. So the first thing we're doing is we're creating right now just a geometry, just a box, a cube, and we put some basic material on it. If a box doesn't, uh, if a geometry doesn't have a material, you don't have anything which reflects light, and you basically don't have anything visual. So you need some kind of material around that, and that together creates our mesh. The mesh is basically the, the real object you can look at, and we add that to our scene. Then we need to define uh, the position of the camera. So the position is a bit away, so we can actually see the object, so not everything is on the same point. So by, by default, they're all set to the zero, zero, zero center. Now we move the camera away, and we can see a cube. Of course, we have to call the render function, which is renderer.render, .render, where you give the scene and the camera. And if you want to have some kind of interaction, you want to call it in a loop. And the way to go there is request animation frame. It's used in basically also for canvas and for many other things. Request animation frame means next time the browser has some free time to prepare something for rendering, uh, use the time to do that. Okay. Um, now, if you want to give some kind of animation, we just add here uh, a rotation, or we change the rotation, and we're changing the rotation in two dimensions, and it starts to spin. Um, yeah, so if a, a normal just cube is too boring for us, there's actually 3D programs in which really good guys can make really cool complex models. It's very hard to really code complex models, so if you want to do something like a hat or um, a table or something, it's way easier to do it in a 3D graphics program. And then you can export those objects. And there, there are multiple standards for how you can export it. One of the simplest is OBJ. And then instead of creating a normal box, you can use uh, the 3 gs <coughs> object loader, where you define a path where you have the object <laughs> file. Then you get that, which has basically the ge geometry of the element. On that, you have to put some material again, and you add it to the scene. You can also have some special material um, that comes later. Also, sometimes WebGL crashes. Not that fun, especially if you do something complex. Um, you can li listen on those events and at least show, oh, WebGL is broken, please reload the page or something useful. So it's not just stuck. So in one of our projects, we wanted to make a 3D rendering of a ring. This one is the geometry of the ring. Uh, on the geometry, we wanted to put some, some material, like some, some surface. In that case, we used uh, images, which you can put on, and then you can define how glossy it is or not, and you're good to go. The only problem, actually, you can, cannot see it that well here, and a geometry consists of triangles. And so if you use a default object, you have some corners. The same way you can see it here, it's kind of like it has a few corners. So um, you have to make a smooth rendering over that. There's a helper in, in 3GS, which works quite nicely. Um, and if you have done all of that, you'll get something like this. So it doesn't look that real yet. On one hand, there is flickering. The flickering comes from uh, if a ring is half a pixel away, it, it kind of flickers one side and the other. And there's a material on it, and it's kind of glossy, but there's no reflection, because we don't have anything to reflect on yet. So that's why it looks quite boring. If you go the other extreme, just to show like 
differences. This is very classy and it has a lot of environment around it, which is reflecting. So the way to do that is that you can use a picture which you can define as environment for reflecting. And you cut up a picture like that. In six pictures, you put one top, one on the bottom, and the other way is around. And um, now you have some things to reflect on. It can be quite tricky to find the right picture. So that would be some kind of typical photo if you have, for example, car renderings. You often have a picture like that. Um, on our ring, it looks very weird because we had all these bluish and yellow colors in a ring. If it's silver, it's kind of confusing and you don't know really where it comes from. But if you have no, um, nothing to reflect, it looks weird as well. So in, in the end, we came to something similar to that. So we have some kind of uh, things to reflect on, but they don't give any color to it and keep it quite neutral. Um, another issue was performance. Uh, one of these rings can easily have half a megabyte up to a megabyte. And so if you load that on a computer, it works quite okay. If you try to load it on a smartphone, you can really see that it takes some time. And also processing of that 3D model, so it runs. So something very important is that you have some kind of visual trigger, uh, some visual element to see that something is going on. And it's called anticipation. So you should show the user something so he focuses on where something comes. You probably know it from Facebook. If you open the Facebook website, there's this, it's not a loading spinner. It shows you where some content will appear, some kind of like white blocks. And the same way we used here. So you see when you open the website in the beginning, it's kind of like showing you where you can expect the ring to load and when it's ready, it appears. And that's an image. That's an image, yeah. It was just a, a, a PNG image with two colors um, and a loading spin in front, so you get that something's happening here. Um, we also tried, um, inside the ring, we wanted to do some engraving, and there was a really nice way to do a high-pass filter, which gives you like a real sense that it's a 3D thing. Um, problem is it's quite slow to do a high-pass filter because you're used to type in the, in, the, in the keyboard and expect to see something. And actually, we did the trade-off to decide to not use a high-pass filter, make it uh, just plain gray, uh, but have the like, real interaction, so it reacts faster to you. So here we have a uh, WebGL rendering. You can drag it around, you can move it. Um, you can change the, the materials. So you can see it looks different by changing Swap, swapping out the materials. And these are actually three parts. So we have three different parts for one ring. So we can swap out the material for each one individually. And we can change the surface, which you see it has different, um, like um, it reflects differently if it's um, clear or if it has a like rougher surface. Okay, and then there's some, some fun things like you can change the size and things like that. <coughs> so you can make it bigger, you can grow it. Um, the engraving we talked about. <laughs> it's like this. Um, you can change the, the font of it and yeah, a lot of other stuff. The next thing was we we wanted to save some, some rendering. So actually we don't have any ground, uh, but we have a, a shadow of a typical ring. And we just put that um, image in Sundquist ring, so it just moves the same speed. So we don't have to render ground because it always looks the same. And, and you will not notice if you don't know. If you know, you notice that on every ring the ground looks the same, but you will never notice in, in a normal way. So something else we did, it was quite tricky to get the, the reflections in this diamond right. Um, because if you have, a, if you have uh, an environment box where you have almost nothing to reflect on, the diamond didn't change a lot of reflections. 
and it looked weird. So for the diamond, so for each object, you can define a different environment. And in our case, we took the diamond and gave it a totally different environment, which basically consists of a lot of different like gray, white, black colors. And this is why we get this like blinky effect when you move the ring around. Um, one of the complex part was actually scaling the ring. It didn't sound that complicated in the beginning, but if you scale a ring, the diamond is of course a separate object because otherwise the diamond would scale the same way. Um, but that means that every time you scale the ring, the diamond has to move out. And every time you scale the diamond, it has to move back in. And if the diamond gets too big, it looks out on the other side. So there's actually quite a lot of uh, code just to handle the correct positioning of the diamond. And also, um, it was quite complicated to figure out the, the right calculation formula. So if you put diamonds on the ring, um, you can't put too many on them. So we had to calculate how many you can put on. Um, but it can happen if you have some size and some diamond size that you maybe can fit half a diamond. So if you just put the diamonds all around the place here, we have half a diamond space here left and it looks super weird. And in, in, when you do the real ring, they think about that and they move every diamond so it looks good. Um, so what we did there is we turned the whole ring so that the empty space is at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so in the beginning actually it, it sounds quite straightforward. And then you find a lot of these small things where you have to adjust a lot. Um, so in the end, just the rendering is not the 10 lines I showed you, but hundreds of lines. Uh, so it was a super fun project. Um, if you have the time, the budget for a project like that, it's super fun. Expect that it will take way longer than you would think in the first place. <laughs> All right. Thank you for watching this talk. Down below you can find our channel Vienna.js where you can find a lot of different videos about front-end and back-end JavaScript and feel free to subscribe.